This episode of Advocates the Podcast is supported by Taylor's Law School, where you get to learn about law and justice. Explore how these top advocates battle injustice as they tell us their stories. Listen to the voices of the advocates. Hello and welcome to Advocates, the place where you get to hear from the best in the business. Today, I chat with Benjamin Aina QC, one of the leading criminal silks in the UK. You wouldn't want to miss his story. Traveling from the south of London all the way to prosecuting very, very serious criminals. Benjamin Aina QC, now. Morning, Ben. Good morning. Right. Uh, thanks for doing this for us today. Could I just start by recalling what you told some of us when you came down to Malaysia a few years back? to train us advocacy traders. You mentioned a particular case you did in which you prosecuted a particularly hardcore gang of South London criminals. There were threats actually made onto you, but you carry on. Could I just ask, why carry on? I mean, were you not worried about, about your personal safety and all that? I think the case you are referring to was in fact, a, a, at the time, a well-known uh, rap group Mm. called So Solid Crew. Right. And the threats were not made in relation to the gang. I think the threats were made in relation to the profession oh. because they were a very popular music group in the United Kingdom and they sang about a lot of black issues that uh, black children were facing, black kids, teenagers were facing London at that time, and a lot of these lyrics that they sang about involved the use of drugs, the use of guns, and this is still a problem in the United Kingdom today with uh, certain gangs rapping about the use of um, knives, the use of guns, and so forth. But in that time, it became a political issue because the government of the day, which was the Labour government, were keen on trying to suppress mm. this kind of behaviour, this kind of activity. And there had been some political statements made by ministers, particular one minister called Kate Hoey, who's still, a, who's still alive and is still a, a politician. And so it had divided the community between the establishment who wanted to suppress this kind of music, this kind of attitude, this kind of behaviour, and the younger generation who just see it as part of their normal life. And it was very rare in those days, it still is rare in the United Kingdom, for a black person to prosecute. I think I am, even now, I am only one of two black QCs that prosecutes in the whole country. So back then, it was, I wasn't known as a prosecutor. I was known as a defender. I did a lot of defense work. But I actually, in secret, also did some <laughs> prosecution. Okay. Work. Right. I didn't make a lot of noise about it. But then I was asked, this group, having carried out a concert at Leicester Square in London, were then seen, allegedly seen, by a lip reader working for the police to be selling drugs outside or close to the venue mm -hmm. where they had just undertaken the concert. And so the police who were keeping undercover, well, there were undercover police watching this, came and raided the area. And one of the suspects ran off and, according to the police, discarded a gun when he was, he was chased to Chinatown, where he discarded a gun. So anyway, I was asked to prosecute this case, and I received a lot of, I received a lot of information, emails from uh, colleagues, solicitors who sent me my defense work, that what are, what are you doing? Right. Why are you prosecuting this case on behalf of the police? Right. It's not going to go down very well in the community. Yeah. So I had the choice of, not prosecuting the case and keeping my defence solicitors happy or prosecuting the case. 
and I chose to prosecute the case. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that's the point I was coming at, uh, at, you see, because I'm sure you, in your family, I suppose, but particularly you, face all, also a pressure to drop yeah. the matter, but you carried on. And I'm wondering where did this come from? Did it, did it come from this value, i.e. what you felt doing the right thing and therefore you got to continue doing the right thing? Did it come from your parents? No, uh, I'll come back to my, my family background in a moment. No, I'm just by nature right. a very stubborn man. Okay. I don't like people telling me what to do. Right. And I am very, very stubborn. Okay. And I don't like judges telling me what to do. I don't like my wife telling me what to do. <laughs> I don't like anybody telling me not what to do. And so the moment somebody starts to tell me what I should be thinking or how I should be behaving or what work I should be doing, that really gets my back up. I don't like that. That's my nature. That's one. And then secondly, I don't like the idea, I never have liked the idea that all of ethnic minorities and black people, the idea that they only defend mm -hmm. and all the white people prosecute. Right. It reminds me of when I was at school. It's like having the difference between the school monitors. So the school monitors go on to prosecute. And everybody else goes on to defend. Right. And what that does, I don't like that because what it does is it feeds into a, it feeds into a political rhetoric mm -hmm. that all black people are bad and all white people are good. Right. So it's only the white people that can act for the state, and the black people, they are the oppressed people who can only defend. And I don't like that. I don't think that's right. And I don't think that society in this country will ever improve while you have the you while you have the this them and us attitude you see when when you prosecute you are seen as part of the establishment the more black people the more ethnic minorities who prosecute the more the establishment will respect black people will respect ethnic minorities and they will realize that we are just as good as them and we are equal to them mm -hmm. Or we don't prosecute and we allow this division of only sort of the white, uh, the white uh, upper class are the only people who, who prosecute, then we feed into this, we feed into this belief that, oh, black people, the only time you see them is when you see them behind the dock or when you see them causing trouble. Uh, you don't see them being good for anything. And I don't like that. So I'm keen to in my life, to change that, that idea. Mm -hmm. And this, I suppose, view of philosophy that you have taken on board with you, did it come from your family or you have developed this over the years as you grew up and when you went through school and university and all that? Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I was born in London mm -hmm. in 1964 into a single parent family. My father left my mother when she was pregnant with me. My mother was originally from Nigeria, arriving in England in 1961. And she was a canteen assistant for the Metropolitan Police. We call them dinner, la dinner ladies in the... Oh, right. Okay. All right. And I was not very good. Between the age of one and 11, I was a bit of a tearaway. Okay. I was a bit of a naughty child, got into a lot of trouble at school. But when I was 11, I went to a state-run boarding school called Wolverston Hall, which was near Ipswich. And that kind of transformed my life because that was a bit like a military regime in a boarding school. And I had to learn to behave. I was the only black boy when I went there. It was a school of 360 boys. And even... Uh, over the years that I was there, only two, three, four more black people joined. And so I came from a very poor background. And when I went to that school, it was a state school run, run for people whose children were in the armed forces and were abroad. And also, I suppose, children, it was an experiment being run by the local authority in London at the time 
to see if you could take children from a poor background and put them in that kind of institution and make something of them. So when I went there, there was, there was a lot of bullying. And I remember that the first term I was there, my mother came to the school to say, she came to the school to take me home. She heard that I was being bullied, I was very unhappy, and I didn't have to go to the school. And when she came to the school, something kicked in in me. I was 11 at the time. Something kicked in in me. I'm not going to let these people win. I'm not going home. No, no. Ah. They, can they can kill me here. <laughs> I am not going home. There's a stubborn streak coming through. <laughs> so I think that that was the first revelation of who I am, that I wouldn't let the fact that I was a minority and I was in this school, I wouldn't allow them to win. And then I think the other thing is that right from day one, my mother was very religious. She was a she was a Christian and she belonged to a particular Pentecostal church. And I was brought up in that church. And that gave me very, very strong beliefs in myself. Very, very strong beliefs in myself. I'm on this earth for a purpose. I'm not just on this earth to come, pass and disappear and go. I'm here for a reason. So I think the combination of those two things made me very strong and the being in that boarding school and having to survive for seven years as a minority made me very strong and I wasn't very clever my my results when I was at school were poor were appalling and uh, when I came out of the school I came out with very appalling grades and I could there was I could only I had two choices of fi- further education one was to do history, one was to do history in Ireland, a place called Coleraine in Ireland. I remember I'm a London boy, so I wasn't, I didn't want to go over to Ireland. All I heard about Ireland was terrorism and crap. <laughs> I didn't want to go to Ireland to history. And then there was this, then there was, and then that was it. And then I was uh, fostered. My mother left England when I was 13 to go back to Nigeria. And she, I was fostered to a white family in the East End of London. And the lady I was fostered with had a contact at a place called Chalmer Institute of Higher Education, as it then was. And uh, she managed to get me in. The, the first day of term, she managed to get me in to do law. Just, you know, call it luck, call it God's grace. She managed to get me in to do law. In fact, it was a very good law school because if I tell you, one of our attorney generals, have you heard of Patricia Scotland? Mm-hmm. Yes, Baroness of Scotland. She went there. Oh, I see. Okay. Anyway, so it was actually a very good law school, but it was an institute of higher education for dropouts. But So I went there, and I uh, first year of my degree, I came second from bottom. I was just I just didn't understand what all this law business was about. Then I went back to Nigeria on holiday, Christmas, and my mum said, oh, no, 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 you have to go back to church. Go to church, take your religion seriously, stop following the crowd, don't – drink, don't do all the things that students do, and buckle down. And so I listened to her. And in the second year of my law degree, I came second from top. <laughs> <laughs> and, from, and from there onwards, something just clicked. I just had this understanding of the law. So from the Palmer Institute of Education, which is now Anglia University, I got a 2-1 degree. I felt a bit shy, a bit embarrassed that I'd been to an institute of uh, higher education. So I, and I, I, I wanted to do law. I, I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. But I was a bit embarrassed. So I thought, let me come down to London and try and go to London University. So I went to London University to do an LLM because I felt that would make me be able to compete better. Mm-hmm. And you know, from doing the LLM, I went and did the bar course. Originally, when I was at school, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I told you I was awful in terms of my academic abilities. I wanted to do medicine. I wanted to be a doctor. And I did biology A-level, which, of course, I flunked. But I realized when I did biology A-level, I I had a love of human anatomy, that uh, you had to take your blood and dissect. I could do the dissection of an insect, but when I took my own blood, I fainted. (laughs) (laughs) So I realized. I realised that medicine was not for me. I couldn't do and, and, of course, that must help with particularly gruesome murder cases that you do, Benjamin. Well, if that's the funny thing about life, because, you see, at, at, at that, that yeah. time, at that time, I, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't stand blood. 
And even now, I hate needles. I really hate needle, needles, but I have a phobia of needles. But as you see, you get older, then you start doing casework where in those days, when we, we were doing murder cases, you actually saw real bodies and you saw photo, photographs of real, you know, dead people. Whereas mm -hmm. now, everything's graphics. You know, you, you, we don't show people the, the real photographs any longer. It's all, it's all graphics. Can I just jump in there and just wind you back a little bit and ask you something that interests me just from a personal perspective for you? And you, you spoke of your mum yep. and her leaving when you were um, 15 to go back to Nigeria and then, and then you went to a, to a foster family. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with both that foster family and your mum today and how that's developed over time. Right. My mother passed uh, away in 2002. My relationship with my mother was fine. She was very religious. And even when she went back to Nigeria, I had a sister. She took my sister back to Nigeria with her, a younger sister. But uh, because I was at this boarding school, she asked me if I wanted to go. And I said, no, I'd like to stay. So she then came back to England when I, when I had completed my degree and I was doing a master's degree. So she came back, got me a flat from the local authority. We were all living together. So my relationship with my mother was fine. I mean, any problems with the fact my mother was was poor and worked every day of her of her life. And I could see that, you know, all she ever did was work. So, you know, I never had any any problems with that. My my foster mother was wonderful. Her name was Diane. And she was, oh, you have to be born and bred in England to understand what I'm about to say. She was a good old-fashioned East End lady. See, in England, we have people from different parts of the country, Yorkshire, and, and in London, we have people from the East End of London. And if you go back to the Victorian ages, these were the people who were the market sellers and the flower sellers and the traders, you know, and they, they were the backbone of, of, the, of the society. She was an old-fashioned East End lady. I mean... And this is where you get to really understand English people. She was the most compassionate woman you could find. She really looked after me. But she was the most racist woman you could ever find. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, it, it, was from, it was from her that I realised that English people don't actually understand what racism <laughs> is. They don't understand. It. Because she, she was the most compassionate woman and she really looked after me and to give you an example of the sort of woman she is she was all right so money was limited and so she would buy a whole lot of mince meat you know what mince meat mm. is she buy mince meat at the beginning of the week that mince meat would be the basis of every meal so monday she would make sausages with it tuesday she would make spaghetti bolognese uh, wednesday she would make uh, some other food Thursday, and all from this mince meat. <laughs> she taught me how to cook. She taught me how to cook and the ingredients, because she used to make everything fresh. And then there's no, going, you know, we'll go to Tesco's or Marks and Spencer, the supermarket to get our, no, 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 didn't do that. Okay. Everything was made from fresh to make it last. And she was just an extremely compassionate, loving woman. But she was racist. I mean, you'd be sitting watching TV. And she made comments like, God, all these people coming over to our country and invading. <laughs> <laughs> and you sitting next to her. I'd be sitting there listening to her. She was the most loving person that you'd ever come across. <laughs> it was, uh, going back to your question, so the relationship was giving me, my, my regret is that we are so busy often as practitioners that we often don't, we're not able to go back and, pay attention to those things that really, really matter in life because, you know, our, our job and our is, is all consuming. But, yeah. <laughs> right. After you, you did your LLM, you decided to go into the bar, right? Yeah. I mean, in England, there's always an option to do, to be at a solicitor's work or to enter the bar. So why, why the bar? Right. Well, I, I should state this. I have always worked from the age of 13. I have always worked because of my background. Right. I used to lie, lie about my age, and I did every job in Under the Sun, uh, kitchen porter, house porter, 
Even I was a drain cleaner in a meat factory when I was 14, a laborer on a building site, every job, a cobbler, a cobbler, even worked in a sausage factory making sausages. I, every, every job on the sun I have done. So when I was doing my degree, I again worked on Saturdays as a car park attendant to make a little bit of money. And then I did some work experience in Chelmsford, where my college was. And I did work experience in a solicitor's firm where they did conveyancing. Do you know, after two weeks of sitting down looking at conveyancing files, I realized that being a solicitor was not <laughs> the job for me. I mean, I must have caught up on three years sleep in those two in those two looking at files, looking at files. I didn't realize it was possible to sleep and look at a file. <laughs> so that completely that completely put me off. The idea of being sat, I didn't I realized that I'm not a person that likes regimen regimented. So the idea of going into an office at nine o'clock in the morning, sitting at a desk, working to one, having lunch, working from two to five or six, that's just not me. I don't like that kind of regimented. I like to move. I like to be moving all the time. You know, I don't mind working to 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. in the morning if I need to, to get a, a case ready. But I like to work at my hours, not <laughs> the hours that are imposed upon me. So I realized that and also, I like talking, as you can probably tell from this interview. <laughs> so, you know, the idea of um, the idea of just sitting at a desk and my my practice looking at papers, no, that wasn't for me. So, after the bar, how do you get into chambers? I gather it wasn't must have been rather difficult, or was it easy for you then to to get a place in chambers? Well, I'm about to contradict myself right. in something I'm about to say because so I did commercial subjects, and then the lady who when I did my first degree, the dean of the faculty of Chalmers Institute of Higher Education then became the dean of the faculty at Polytechnic of Central London. And she invited me to start lecturing there. So I applied, I, and I was teaching in commercial subjects. And so all the chambers that I applied to were commercial, sub, were commercial chambers. In fact, planning chambers. I wanted to do planning law. Oh, okay. And I, so I applied to planning chambers and I applied to commercial chambers because I wanted to do commercial law. And so I ended up, in, in those days, there were only 4,000, approximately 4,000 barristers, whereas now there are 17,000. So in those days, it wasn't as difficult to become a barrister as it is now. And I don't know what it is I, about me. I, I applied to all these sets and I got offers. I got offers to do planning at Sir Frank Layfield set, and I got an offer at Chalmer, Chalmer at uh, Deborah Chambers. And the other thing that happened to me is I got a scholarship from Lincoln's Inn. I was told by people at Lincoln's Inn that, you know, if you want to get a scholarship, do a lot of debating. And I love debating. I love talking. So I did the debating, and I, and I managed to get a scholarship. So for me, getting... It was not difficult. It was just putting your application. And in that, in, at that time, in 1986, when I was applying, I was getting people, getting policy was not the was not the difficulty. What you just had to be patient. You would get in somewhere. So I applied. I got my scholarship, and I got a, I got a pupilage pupilage at Deborah Chambers. And that was a commercial set. And that was a commercial set. And I I was um. <laughs> now I'm going to contradict myself. My first pupil master, who's now passed on, he only did personal injury work. Oh, I see. Okay. So for the first six months of pupillage, I was just sat looking at papers after papers after papers after you know, personal injury, you know, pleadings, just pleadings after pleadings after pleadings, using Amstrad. Uh, Alan Sugar had just created his Amstrad computer. So I might. Okay, all right. Uh, I had to learn to use, and I was just doing pleading. And I, I think somewhere, I still have those pleadings. I must have done about four or five hundred pleadings in that six-month period. And I named myself a shelf tenant because I just had a desk facing a shelf, and that was all that I did. <laughs> and bear in mind, bear in mind that um, I hated paperwork. Right. 
I hated the idea of just sitting down looking at paper, which is why I didn't want to. So that was a bit of a shock to the system. But then after that, my second six, I was, my pupil master was a chap called Peter Clark, who went on to be the, uh, one of the, I think, the president or chairman of the Employment Appeal Tribunal. And he did employment work. So that was a bit more exciting. Uh, but also in the second six, you, you're on your feet. And so I started to do some uh, work in the magistrate court, which you do as a pupil. Uh, in Devra, they were the main solicitor was the Transporter General Workers Union for vehicles. And I did all I did, I started to do bus driver cases, um, as well as go to the county court. But when I started on my feet and I started to do bus driver cases very quickly became apparent that I was very good at it because I, I kept I kept on winning, kept on winning all these winning all these bus driver cases. And in the, when you do pupillage, so there was four, uh, four of us doing who were pupils. And when we started off, after a while, the Transport General Workers Union, they would only ask for me. Okay. <laughs> ask for anybody else i was guessing all the work can i just stop you there and just ask you a question i mean um, these early years 85 in chambers uh, and in the profession i would imagine very few black barristers so what was it like what was the atmosphere like for you i mean coming from that sort of school you know where you were the only black kid now you're in chambers you're probably the only black barrister what was the atmosphere like in chambers and in court how how were you treated by the judges in those early days I was treated brilliantly in chambers. I got on very well with um, everybody there. And in fact, they told me that if it wasn't for the fact that they wanted to get rid of all their criminal work, they would have taken me on as a tenant because they, it's clear I was a good, good criminal barrister, but uh, they, they wanted to get rid of that work. I was treated really well. I think that I'm different from what they, what most people expect in, res, in relation to black people. But most of the black people that the profession was used to were black people who would come from the Caribbean as immigrants in the 60s. And they had um, an accent, they had a thick Caribbean accent, and they were coming in as immigrants. And they hadn't, they, they hadn't really experienced a black person who was born in the United Kingdom and raised in the United, in the United Kingdom. So for all intents and purposes is a white person with a black skin, but with a, a slightly different culture. So they hadn't experienced that. So I think they found me intriguing because they were not used to just, you know, somebody who's ordinary. And also I'm Benjamin. I, you can see from this interview, I'm very positive. I, I mean, I, they told me, I, I give you an example. You asked me how they saw me. Well, when I was taken on, I asked them, well, you know, you took me on as a pupil. Why did you take me on as a pupil? And they said it was very, very simple. They said that when you came to the interview, you had to come to the very top of the building. And when you walked up the stairs to the top of the building, the lady, there's a, the receptionist, a very old lady, brought you up to the top of the building. And when you came into the interview, the lady who brought you in was laughing. And so they actually said, do you remember we asked you what did you say to her to make her laugh like that? And I said, well, it's only that the, the climb up the building, the, the climb up the stairs was so tough, there was no lift, that halfway up I said to her, this is like Mission Impossible. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know the film Mission Impossible. Yeah. I, so I think I said, this is like Mission Impossible, you know, and I haven't even got into the interview yet. <laughs> <laughs> They told me that they were so impressed because that lady, she never laughed. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, if I could make her laugh, and I've not even, I've not even got into the interview yet, that was already a positive, you know. So no, problem, no problems in chambers. The judiciary, do you know, I don't, looking back now, I guess there was a lot of racism. But, you know, I never really... I never really clocked that. I never really clocked that. I just clocked that there were a lot of very rude people sitting on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I saw it. And because of my background, I never had a father, so I never had a father to put me in my place, which might have helped. And because of my attitude, I won't, 
I'm stubborn. I won't allow people to be rude to me or tell me what to do. When the judges were rude to me or apparently rude, I just stood up to them and just don't talk to me like that. I'm, I'm here to I'm here to I'm here to represent somebody. You're going to listen to me. And I think they were shocked. They were shocked that one a barrister would talk back to them like that, and two a black barrister because I'm, <laughs> most of the black barristers are very very were very very meek because they had suffered a lot of prejudice. And they hadn't got into any chambers, so they were very, very meek. So to have somebody like me talking back, there was one barrett, there was one judge, he was an army judge. His background was from the military. And I was doing a I was doing a Crown Court trial as a drugs case. And we had a standing row. We had a standing row. And uh, he walked off the bench. He just lost his <laughs> he walked off the bench. <laughs> and, then, and then he came back because <laughs> he couldn't believe. But you see, the one thing that saved me, because mm. otherwise I would, have, it would have, the establishment would have cut me down. The one thing that saved me was that because I had taught the law of evidence when I was lecturing, I knew the law inside out. And I knew Archbold, mm -hmm. the, the, the practice. In those days, it was one small book. And I knew Archbold inside out. If I could quote where something was in Archbold without even opening it. I could just say, look, turn to paragraph, you'll find it there. And an example is that that judge, that military judge, who stormed off the bench and hated me, there was a point, a very important point of law, one of my early cases in the Court of Appeal, point of law that arose from one of his drug cases, where he ruled against me, you know, with a big smile, ruled against me, I'll teach you, put you in your place. And I went to the Court of Appeal and I won. They overturned him. And the next time I was in front of him, the same point came up and he stopped the prosecutor said, no, 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 no. This point came up last time and Mr. Ada took me to the Court of Appeal and he won. Fair do. <laughs> and, and from that moment onwards, mm. it was really, really nice to me. <laughs> what it taught me is that if you know your yeah. stuff, if you really know your stuff in England, you know your law and you really prepare your cases, Although the judiciary might appear to be against you, they may appear not to like you, behind the scenes, they actually have an ad admiration for you. And as I, as I grew older in the profession, I began to realize that whatever their views were, they actually admired, they actually admired the fact that you knew what you were doing. And that, 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 that's a lesson that most young people need to learn. Could I just ask, uh, in those early years, in terms of um, influences, who were the major influence um, in your career? Well, obviously, my church background was all very important to me. Uh, probably uh, my pupil, my first pupil master, my pupil masters, they uh, encouraged me. You know, they encouraged me. They, they, I mean, my first pupil master took me to his home, introduced me to his wife, and uh, made me feel at home, made me feel that, you know, I was part of um, a team. So... Yeah, the Denver Chambers were very supportive towards me. So that, that, that he was a good... The other person who was a, uh, also a good influence on me was uh, when you come to Lincoln's Inn, you have to have... You have a, something called a sponsor. When you're called to the bar, your sponsor finds you somebody to sponsor you to be called. And I had a sponsor at Lincoln's Inn when I first came. That sponsor was David Perry. I'm sure you've heard of David Perry, Kesey. Uh, because he'd done a lot of work over in your part of the world. And he was my sponsor. And uh, he was a great encouragement to me. I mean, he was very bright, very personable, but he made me feel that the profession was was there for people like me. So, <laughs> yeah. yes. And so, okay, can I also ask, in those early years before you became a QC, you started off as a commercial lawyer, then you sort of gravitated towards crime. How, how did that happen? I always did both. It's not wasn't that I, I gravitated. You see, at Denver Chambers, it was a commercial set where they were they had crime for the youngsters. I see. But they were trying to get rid of their crime. So when I wasn't taken on, because Ingrid Simler, who's now Lord Justice, Lady Justice, uh, Sim, uh, was my contemporary. She was taken on. The crime that they were doing at Denver, when I left, it followed me. Ah, okay. So they lost, <laughs> they lost a lot of their crime work. It followed me, and it followed me to the set that they, they, they arranged for me called Mitre Court Chambers. I went to a small set called Mitre Court Chambers. 
And at Mitre Court Chambers, I did, I continued to do the crime, the transport and general workers union work, the bus driver work, other more crime. But I also maintained the civil work because I had made friends with uh, people of the same age as me in the civil departments of the firms that briefed that briefed Deborah Chambers. And so some of these people continued to send me the civil work, the personal injury work in particular, and the contract work. So I did both. But I would say I was doing, I would say I was doing 60% crime, 40% civil work. Ben, do you find crime, or I mean, which, which area actually do you prefer actually, personally? Or do you find more challenging? Well, I enjoyed doing the civil work. I mean, one of the reasons I enjoyed doing the civil work is that there are, there are no black people who do civil work at that time. So every time you turned up to court, you know, you're already, you, you see, the, the, job of a, the job of a barrister is to persuade the court to your, to your opinion, to your way of thinking. It's a job of persuasion. So if you're, if you're black and you're turning up, and in order to persuade people, they've got to listen to you. So if you're black, and everyone's thinking, who is this person? You've already, you're already halfway yeah. there. They're, they're interested in hearing what you've got to say. Because they're thinking, who is this young starter? So there were no black people doing civil work. So I enjoyed doing the civil work. I enjoyed that, that aspect of, you know, of the work. But the problem with the civil work is that in order to have a proper big civil practice that would take you towards silk in commercial work you need to be one of the big commercial chambers where they're doing that level of work and what happened with me is that as i grew older by the time i got to 14 years uh, experience i was getting massive criminal work i was getting seven eight month trials fraud trials you know for company directors for a represented Mr. Viagra, as he was called, you know, there was a time when you get all those emails back in the day <laughs> for Viagra, you know. And this man, I represented this medical doctor from Mexico, was said to be the person who was responsible for all these emails going around the world. You know, Mr. Viagra, he was very and you know, that, that case lasted seven months. It, you know, I was getting massive. Almost as long as the Viagra, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, well, I would. <laughs> But I was getting these massive you know, fraud cases, paying really well, and then suddenly in the middle of it, I would get a three-day county court action against the police. Okay. And I couldn't really take time out from the big fraud to do the three-day county court hearing, or it wouldn't be fair on the client for me to do that. So I began to realise that I, I couldn't do both. I would have to, I would have to specialise, and so. About that time, about 14 years call, I just, I more or less stopped, stopped doing, I certainly stopped doing the personal injury work. And also the other thing that happened was that around that time, the, the civil courts changed, the whole, civ the, the whole civil procedure changed. We then had what we call Part 36 offers coming in, where you could pay money into court. And you, I don't know if part, you know what Part 36 yeah. is. You can pay yeah. money into court on the other side. If they don't beat the payment, you're liable for costs. You know, we had all these changes yeah, in civil yeah. procedure. And I thought to myself, do I really want to have to go through all the, you know, attend all these things to update myself? So I just, I just bumped down on the civil work. And I effectively, the only civil work I was then doing was actions against the police. And even after a while, that, that wound down. Uh, was it around this time also you started to get prosecution work? As I told you, and I, and I meant it seriously. I always prosecuted. I always prosecuted, but I just didn't make a big deal about it. Nobody knew. I, so what would happen is that 80% of my, my work was defence work. But then you would have a, maybe you would have like a two-week or three-week gap between your next defence brief. And the clerk would say, would you, would you want to go, would you like to go to prosecute a three-day firearms case in some court somewhere? And I think, yeah, I'll go and do that. They, they don't know me in this court. I'm going, so right. I would go. Okay. I would go and I would do, I would go and do the little prosecution work. So I always kept my hands in uh, doing the prosecution. And then something, there was a big change. If I could just, there was a big change in the UK. I can't remember when it was, but it was maybe around, 
when I was about 16 years experience, they, the, the Crown Prosecution Service changed the way that they instructed barristers. They had something called a grading system. And every barrister in the United Kingdom had to apply for a grade. And you could only do work in accordance with your grade. And they then had something called the preferred set system, where they would only use certain sets of chambers for their prosecution work. So if your set wasn't the preferred set, that was the end of your prosecution practice. So all the sets had to apply for preferred set status. And the set I was in at the time, John Coffey set, was a, was a very big prosecution set. They, they, produced, they were a judge factory. They produced lots of judges and lots of prosecution work. So everybody who was there had to prosecute. and had to. So I was there. And as a result of these changes, opportunity to prosecute even more grew because it, we became a preferred set. Prosecution Sorry. I was struck by what you um, you said earlier about uh, doing trials that lasted six months, seven months. And I presume because you've got a jury impaneled, it's a, a straight six months or a straight seven months. Uh, that's not something I think civil lawyers will be will, will, will be uh, familiar with. So I wanted to ask, what's it like? And it must be that you live with a case for that period of time. What's it like just living with one case for that length of time? Number one, you always have another barrister in such cases. So it'd be, you'd, you'd be, I'd, I'd be the leading counsel. Even, even before I took Silk, you'd have a junior barrister to assist you. Okay, two, you should be aware we don't have six or seven month cases any longer. So there was a period between when I was 16 years cool and when I took Silk. So I took Silk in 2009. So let's say between 2000 and 2009, there was a period where we had these very long fraud cases, the Jubilee Line case that went for a year. You just had these very long fraud, prosecuted by the Serious Fraud Office. And eventually the judiciary got fed up. <laughs> And they said, this is too much strain on the judge. This is too much strain on the jury to take people out of their ordinary lives as juries to try a case for seven, eight, nine months. You know, you're, the whole of their life is taken away. You, it's just too, so they stop. So now you will very rarely have a trial that would last longer than three months. But going back to your original question, oh, back then it was fine. It was like having a normal day job, you know? You're going to the same court. Yeah, to see the same people. And it's a relationship that develops. You develop a relationship with the jury. And remember, for me, I'm the only black person. That's a, that's a given. So you, and, and you're facing a jury, a mostly white jury. You might have a couple of ethnic minorities. So they're always intrigued by me because I'm not. You see, you must remember, in England, people think of barristers in a particular way. So my name is Benjamin Aina. You see, and I am here to tell you what the law is all about. You know, I'm going to step up a lip, and uh, so that's the perception of why, of the people that, of how a barrister should be. So when you see a person that's just ordinary, <laughs> who's ordinary but from the street, but knows the law and knows what he's doing, they're you're, they're intrigued by it, you know, and and, and a relationship develops and. Many a time in those long cases, the judge would say to me, we'd come in the morning and the judge would say to me, after like half an hour, Mr. Rainer, we, we haven't heard from you. You haven't said anything. And I'd say, well, I've got nothing useful to say, Your Honor. You know, there'd, there'd be this relationship, this banter that had developed. That, you know, so it was good. And also, more importantly, it paid the bills. Because those cases were very well paid, you know on a daily basis, and it's guaranteed. So you know, I'm in this long case for six months. You can tell the bank manager, hey, I'm going to be earning X amount of money this year because this is what you know I'm doing. So that's very important. <laughs> <laughs> Just to follow up from that, and one thing that strikes me with you, I mean, we spoke to other lawyers, and I mean, Razlan and I do long cases as well, and they can consume you. Clearly with you, these long cases just don't consume you at all, do they? <laughs> No, I'm very, I'm very, right from the days of conveyancing, yeah. I'm good at sleeping. When I went, you learn the habit of uh, being able to switch off when it's just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, uh, not important, yeah. Right, so 
I was just uh, intrigued because you do both sides. Um, and I know barristers in England do both sides. But uh, this is quite rare uh, in Malaysia, actually, because we got a, a specific prosecution service from the Attorney General's Chambers. What's the difference in prosecuting and defending? Is there a different mental approach? And how do you treat the evidence? How do you, pre- you know, what's the difference for you? Well, first of all, it's, it's actually becoming very rare in England to have people who prosecute and defend. People do, but it's becoming rare. Although it's now going to change because everybody is desperate for work at the moment because of coronavirus and the, the court being shut and everybody needing to pay the bills, more and more people realise they have to do both because otherwise they're not going to be able to feed their family. Now, uh, yeah, it is different. When you defend, you only have to find one weakness in the prosecution case, and that's the end of the case. So when you're defending, what you're doing, you're sitting back and you're working out, a good defence lawyer is working out where the weakness is. And a good defence lawyer keeps quiet until he gets to the area of the weakness and then he, bang, hits the prosecution. Because he knows if he hits the prosecution on that weak area, that's the end of the case. Now, the weak area might be a particular witness. It may be that out of the 40 witnesses... The prosecution are calling. There's one witness that affects his client. And he knows that if he can destroy that one witness, that's the end of the case. So it may be that the way he destroys the witness is by the time the witness comes to the the witness box, you have so discredited the witness to other witnesses that it doesn't matter whatever that witness says, it is over. That's one way. You've laid traps for other witnesses that this witness... Nobody's going to believe. Or it may be that you have the traditional frontal attack on the witness. The defence lawyer is always looking for the one or two weaknesses in the def- in the prosecution's case. And that requires a lot of mental strength because it may be that a good defence lawyer may keep quiet a lot of the time and need to explain to his client why he's keeping quiet. You see a lot of defence lawyers who are not very good who are talking all the time. They feel the need to ask witnesses questions all the time. And part of the reason for that is boredom. They get bored. (laughs) And so they feel they have to open their mouths. They're not doing their client any good. The skill about being a good defence lawyer is to only open your mouth when it's absolutely necessary. Now, prosecuting is completely different. When you're prosecuting... You're on your feet all the time. You're running the case all the time. Nothing must go wrong. So from the moment you get to court to the moment you leave court, you're working. You're working. Now, it depends which side you like. depends on your character. I have changed. I think when I was younger, I loved defending. I loved, you know, taking my technical points. Taking, in fact, <laughs> I was uh, doing a court case just last week, and the barrister defendant was reminding me that he was he took over. He came to watch me do a case about thirty years ago in the divisional court, the high court, where in the magistrates' court I had made an argument that the magistrates should throw the case out, and the magistrates refused. And I didn't call my client. I said, "Well, look, okay, you're not going to throw. I'm not calling my client." You have to be sure on the criminal side. You've got to be sure. And they were really angry that I wasn't calling my client because they wanted me to call my client so there could be a case. And I yeah, yeah. convicted him. So I went to the divisional court to say there was no basis for them to convict him. And, of course, this barrister was reminding me because he was at the divisional court. Of course, we won in the divisional court. So when you're defending, I used to love defending because you could take technical points, you could take arguments I used to love it but as I've grown older I prefer prosecuting the reason why I prefer prosecuting is because as you grow older there is a danger you become bored because you've been doing the same job for such a long time yeah and so if you're defending and you're say you're in a three-month case and there's only one witness that affects your client. You're just sitting there day in, day out, doing nothing. (laughs) Intellectually, it's really boring. Yeah? Yeah. And and I'm an active person. Whereas when you're prosecuting, you are on your feet working all the time. 
And for me, I work just as hard when I defend and when, as to when I prosecute. So I'm still going to do the same work. So I prefer prosecuting as I grow old because you're always working. And also one other thing, as you get older, the cases, the cases I do are all very serious cases. So when I'm defending, very often nowadays, I'm defending kids. We have a lot of gang violence in England, a lot of life crime uh, kinds of kids. And I'm, I'm often defending children. They're, they're 14, 15, 16 years old. When a we're part of a gang that's taken knives and killed, killed another kid. Yeah? And these cases are stressful because they never give you any instructions. You go down there, they're all silence, gang, code of honor. They never give you any instructions. You have to go and see them every day. You're a social worker. You have to go and see them every day to make sure they're happy, make sure they're getting their food. It's not, nothing to do with doing the law. It's just about keeping them. And it is tiring. You know, when you're 20, 30, 40 years, you've got the energy. I'm 56. I'm to go down to the cells, uh, speak to the kid. How are you? Because there's no, there's often no parents around or anybody, you know. So you're, you're in like a social worker. How are you? Huh? And it's, it's draining. It's tiring. And then you have to go up to court to do your job. And often you get judges who are not sympathetic. They've forgotten what it's like to be in practice. They've forgotten what it's like to go down. They don't want to go in a rush. Get over the game. Oh, we're still in. Why are you late? Why are you not? Why? Oh, because the cells were full and I have to wait my turn to get into the cells. And you know, why are you delayed me by 15 minutes? You know? And you're just thinking to yourself, oh, why don't you get off your rockers and just hang yourself? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can't kill a lot. So it's stressful. Whereas when you're prosecuting at this level, everybody's on your side. You've got a team of right. You got a team of police officers who do, who do all the work. Anything you ask them to do, it's done. When you get to court, the judge is on your side because he wants the people accused of murder or terrorism to be acquitted. So the judge is on your side. So it's much easier, as you, you know, at this <laughs> level to prosecute than it is to defend. So that's the reason why I prefer. Uh, prosecutor, but you know, I'm always going to get defense work because I'm only one of what seven or eight ethnic minority silks in the UK, so you're still gonna, you know, <laughs> right. And talking about uh, uh, the state of the criminal law now in the UK, so more like criminal practice in the UK, we, we understand the last few years there have been severe cuts to, to legal aid and all that, and we see lawyers, uh, the barristers striking or taking to the streets, you know. Um, what are your views upon this? I mean, are these cuts, radical as it is, really necessary? And surely it's affected the quality of justice being delivered? Yeah, I mean, the cuts are very ser- The cuts were very serious. In fact, so serious that most chambers believe that there wouldn't be any public law chambers anymore in England. Nobody would be able to, because the cuts were so severe. Then there was a bit of a moratorium and they stopped. They didn't go as far as they were going to go. And there's been a little bit of a revival. But I would say that, to give it an example, my income has been cut by, I would say, 50% over the last 10 years. I mean, I earn less as a silk than I did, uh, than I was earning as a junior 10 years ago. They really, really cut the they've cut everything and uh, to the bare bone. And even the uh, judiciary, in terms of the court buildings, they, they close court buildings, they don't, uh, they prefer, it's cheaper for them to pay a judge to sit at home and do nothing than for a judge, for them to open a court, for the judge to sit in the court. So they have judges, before the pandemic, they had judges sitting at home. Yeah. But they're on full pay, doing nothing, doing nothing. Wow. Because... Because the conservative government, everything is the, everything is balancing the books. So if it's cheaper to have, if it's cheaper to have a judge at home, well, we'll have the judge at home. We're still paid him. Yeah. That the court where we have to pay the court staff to open the court. So the the cuts have been really, really quite bad, and now the government is in a real difficulty. They're in a real problem because of the COVID pandemic. Now they're in a situation where they don't have, we only had trials that started in July. Most courts have only one one trial per court building. And we have this massive backlog, massive backlog of cases. 
And the government is now under huge pressure to have to provide money to provide what we call temporary buildings for trials to be heard because you can't keep people in custody for two, three years, which is what, what will happen. So we're waiting to see what's going to happen. And in fact, this is an, an area that I am this is an area that I am involved in because what's what we are doing or what, what I'm involved in is I'm running a number of cases where the government is trying to keep people in custody. And I am saying they can't keep them in custody because under the law they have to explain what they're doing to give them a trial date. And at least this point is going to be tested in the higher court soon. Uh, I think the higher courts are desperate for this point not to come to them because they don't want to, the judiciary don't want to see, be seen to be at loggerhead with the government. Because if, if the case goes before the higher courts, the reality is the government have not done enough and the judges are going to have to say that, which would be criticism yeah. of the executive. So I think they're trying to avoid the four cases I've been involved in where this point has come up. They have immediately given my client a trial date. <laughs> To avoid, to, avoid us going, to avoid us going to the higher court. But now I am being briefed by other people, other barristers who want me to take the point on the bar. So we will get there eventually. Uh, so, yeah, it's very, it's very, very precarious where we are. It's quite serious at the moment. And they said that if the government doesn't sort things out by October, they've been told that 60% of barristers won't be able to do this work. They will go bankrupt because they haven't got any money to pay to pay their bills. So it's a very very serious problem. Before the COVID, before, when that issue of the strike arose, the reason why people were going on strike was that people who were like five six years experience were only being able to make about twenty thousand pounds a year. Now you do the calculations. When I was five, six years experience, I was making the equivalent of about seventy or eighty thousand a year. You can't twenty thousand pounds a year is what we used to pay article clerks or apprentice. I mean, a London Transport Underground driver is paid thirty five thousand pounds a year. You're paying a train driver more than you're paying a lawyer who spent six years to qualify. That is ridiculous. That's how bad it was. To put it into context, <laughs> right. So, uh, can I ask, um, particularly during during this time of the pandemic, there have been moves to have, say, virtual trials. Now, I'm just wondering, could that work in a criminal trial setting? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe you could have a virtual trial. I don't know. You might be able to have a virtual trial if somebody was charged with. Um, a driving offence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. driving under influence. Your two witnesses are the police officers and you have a defendant in the magistrate's court, but the answer is no. And we haven't had virtual trials in criminal work in the UK. Don't believe anyone who says that. We've had a lot of virtual hearings for preliminary hearings. Ah, uh, right, okay. But not trial. Everything that's the directions here, yeah. But not trial. That's the problem. We make our money from trials, and there are no trials. That's the problem. <laughs> right. Coming to trial itself, uh, in, in, you know, your, your, your trial preparation, right? If you're prosecuting, obviously you take instructions from the police and from your instructing solicitors and all that. So how do you structure the evidence? Do you, is it by way of chronology, or do you actually look at the charge and see what are the elements and then try to break it up? How, how do you do it, actually? Right. So prosecuting is easy because when you're prosecuting, the, the police will provide you with a, a detailed case summary at my level. Obviously, the lower the level, maybe the preparation is less. But my level, you'll get a very detailed police summary of the evidence, depending on the nature of the case. So for the moment, at the moment, I'm doing a, I'm prosecuting a five-handed drugs conspiracy case next year. It was six-handed, but one of the defendants has pleaded guilty. In that case, the police provided me with a 120-page document setting out all the evidence. If it's, murder, if it's a murder case, they will provide you with a case summary. It might run to 50 pages, setting out where all the evidence is. So when you're prosecuting, you take that document, you put it on your computer, or they send it to you electronically. So it's on your computer electronically. You read through it once to have an idea of what the case is about, yeah? 
So once you've read through it, then what I then do is that I then get, I then go to the statements and start at statement number one, read through statement number one, and as I'm reading through statement number one, ask myself, does the police summary accurately reflect what is in the statement? If not, I would then add to that summary what is missing, because obviously police officers are police officers, and I say that respectfully, but yeah, you know what I mean yeah. by that. There's always a slant. There's always a slant coming from a police officer. Right, right. If you're a police officer is going to prepare something as a lawyer would do, being aware that if he goes too over the top, that he's given the defence an area to attack. It's like putting your head out too far. You don't put your head out too far. So don't over exaggerate what the witness is saying. So the witness might say, "I saw." I saw a man five feet away with a knife and he was he was moving in a downward motion, all right? But the police officer may have left out of that account that the person saying that wears glasses. Ah, okay, okay, right, right. So you want to put in your case summary, Mr. X wears glasses and he's short-sighted. He saw somebody, so that you, you're, you're up front. The police officer won't necessarily always put the downside of things. Uh -huh. So you go through the statement carefully to make sure that it that you are your case sum is reflecting both sides of the coin to avoid future areas of attack. So you go through all of that, and, and then the second thing that you're doing is as you're going through it, you're making a note of anything that is missing. So there, there will all, there will sometimes be things that are missing. Like you might say, have the police checked the mobile phone of this witness to see if the mobile phone supports the cell site that supports him being where he says he was or whatever it might be. You know, I have the police followed up on, on X, Y, and Z. Uh, why is, why has the witness run away to Australia? <laughs> you know, so you make notes of things, further disclosure that you want the police to make for you. So you, you, you run through all of that. At the end of that, be I have what's called a preliminary case statement, which is, a, sorry, a preliminary case summary, which deals with the case as it is at the beginning. I then have a list of questions, which I then turn into a, a written advice, which is then sent off to the police and the Crown Prosecution Service. And then the next step is, I'd like to have a conference so that the police can see me and I can see them and then we can start to build a relationship because the police have to trust. The police have to trust you. And also, when you're prosecuting, there is always what is in the back of your mind is, is there something that they're not telling me? <laughs> so you want to be able to sit across the table after you've done all the preparation and said, and, and ask them, look them in the eye and say, do we have any disclosure problems here? Do we have any problems with informants? Do we have any problems with any witnesses that um, the police have been paying on the police role? Are these witnesses reliable? Are they going to turn up at trial? You, know, you have to sit across the table and have a frank discussion with them. I need to know what the problems are at this early stage so that we can work out a way around them. So that's prosecuting. Now, defending is actually defending is a similar approach. You get the police, normally the prosecution will send you, because they're obliged to do it, they'll send you the police uh, summary, which has been disclosed to the judge. And defending, you're doing exactly the same thing. You're going through the witness statement. But this time, you're going through the witness statement. It all depends on the solicitors that are instructing you. Sometimes the solicitors will send you what's called a proof of evidence. So you have client's instructions very early on. You read your client's instructions to know what his case is. And, and, but often you won't have instructions from the client to begin with. Very often the client won't have said anything in interview. And actually, that's the best client to have at the beginning. The best client to have at the beginning sometimes is a client who said nothing in interview and doesn't give you any instructions. Because that then gives you free reign. So when you have okay. a patient case... You read it and you're able to look for the weaknesses as you read it and you're able to drop down the weaknesses. And you can then do an advice to your client saying, 
These are the weaknesses in the prosecution's case. Now you can go off and give instructions to your solicitors. The client who, you see, it may be that the witness who, who purports to, to identify your client, the identification is rubbish. You can't take that point mm -hmm. if your client has already said in an interview, yeah, I was there. So sometimes client keeping quiet is the best policy, particularly if he's, particularly if he's guilty. <laughs> <laughs> And then you, you know, the evidence is not good again. And then, and then you can point out to the defence solicitor, these are the weaknesses in the case. Go and talk to the client. Tell him what the weaknesses are and then give me instructions. And could you just ask you, uh, just uh, to follow up on that, because you are a QC now, and of course you have a junior. So how do you decide to divide your work then? Because it seems to me that you are doing everything then. Then after that, what, what happens? How do you say, you take this part and I take that part then? One of the most difficult things when you become a QC is to let go. The reason why you become a QC is because you've, you've worked hard and you're used to preparing your cases inside out. And so one of the most difficult things is to trust somebody else to prepare part of the case. So the first thing is, is being able to have a measure of control where possible over who your junior is. So I would say 70% of the time I'm able to choose my junior. So I have juniors that I trust, people who I know are ambitious and work really hard and they want to, you know, they want to become QC. So that's the first thing. My practice still save where I'm really, really busy. So there are times when I'm running three or four cases at the same I'm running three or four cases at the same time in terms of preparation. And then a new case comes in, yeah? Then I will say to the junior, X, I'm choosing you as a junior. I'm really busy. I haven't got time to read this and prepare it at this stage. Too busy. So you prepare the case. You do the case summary if it's prosecuting. Or you read the case. Tell me what the weaknesses are. And in two or three, four weeks, time, I'll be less busy and I'll be able to look at your work and look at the case. That is the way that, I would say 50%, maybe 60% of QC's work. It's not really the best way of working. Uh, the way I prepare the majority of my cases is, I, as I, is as I did when I was a junior. I get the case and I do all the work. I prepare it. I prepare the case summary, as I've said, and the advice. I then give that to the junior and say, right, here's the case summary with all the references. Here's my advice. You now run with it. If there's any if there's any fresh evidence that comes in, you know where it fits in. When the police start to give answers to my various inquiries, you know where it fits in. And I leave it with the junior. I only return back to, having done all the work, I only return back to the case when we're getting ready for trial. Because I've done all the work to set the case up for the junior to run with. And during the trial itself, obviously you'll take the main witness, so you will decide... Who do you take, or do you take all witnesses? I take all witnesses. Yeah, no, I take all witnesses. So what happens in a trial is that I will take all witnesses, but I, the junior will – the junior has a different roles. The, the, the first role is the junior – in most modern trials, you have what's called agreed facts. You probably have this mm, in – Yeah, yeah. Right. So the judge is like everything to be an agreed facts where it's, there's no real dispute. So that's the junior's job. The junior will, will, will team up with the opposition junior and they will produce the agreed fact. And if you're, if you're prosecuting, the junior will read the agreed facts to the, ju to the jury. Yeah? The other thing that the junior will do is where you have witness statements, if you're prosecuting and the defence don't want that witness to come to court, they're happy for the, the witness statement to be read, the junior will do all the reading of the witness statements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The junior will also deal with interviews. So if the defendant has opened his mouth and you've got four or 500 pages of interviews, again, the judges don't like four or 500 pages of interview being read to the jury. It bores everybody. So the junior's job is to reduce the interviews to a summary. So if you've got four or 500 pages of interviews, to reduce them to 50 pages. So the juniors will have to put their heads together to agree a document that reflects what the defendant is saying in his interview. And then again, prosecution junior will read those interviews to the jury. And also, 
Prosecution Junior will always be responsible for disclosure. Oh. So the police are disclosing material because normally new evidence, once I have prepared the main evidence, there isn't that much new evidence that will come in. There's some, but not that much. The main task of the junior barrister is to keep an eye on disclosure. The defence will be asking, we want this, we want that. The prosecution junior's job is to say, no, you can't have it, or yes, you can have it. And if she's not, or she is not sure, get on the phone to me and say, Ben, I'm not sure about this. Should I disclose this or not? Yeah, but they are in charge of disclosure. There's a lot of work for the prosecution junior. If you're defending, you know, I always say to the junior, keep the client off my back. So <laughs> I, always, I always want juniors who get on with the client. You just keep the client off my back. Once the car starts, I ain't got time. I told you I get tired. I ain't got time to be going down to the cells every five minutes to see the client. Keep the client happy. You go, you see the client in the morning. You see the client in the evening. Tell the client, I will come and see him when something important is happening. Keep the client happy. So keep the family happy. You've got the family outside call. What do you know what's going on? Keep the family happy. I'll see the family once a week, but you keep them happy. So the junior, and then the junior where you're defending has to make a note of everything that's happening in court. If there's a legal point that arises suddenly that no one has foreseen, the junior needs to be able to open Archbold find out where the relevant part of our body is and give it to me to say, look, this is where it is, Ben. And then I might say to the junior, there's two authorities. I know those authorities. Go and get those authorities. So the junior has to be able to be electronic, get the electronic copy of the of the, of the the authority for my attention. So that's what the junior does. We're going on a different area now, which is basically the quick fire section of the interview. Could I just ask, in your practice, which judge basically challenged you the most? Oh, I saw that. Yep. Court of Appeal. I can't say Jack. Court of Appeal. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because they're very bright. Right. And they take no prisoners. Okay. And they, they go straight to the point. Like you might have prepared half an hour to talk to them. They will ask you the point that's on. Uh, say you've got 20 pages. They will ask you about the point that's on page 19. As soon as you get to your feet. <laughs> okay. Which opponent do you, do you respect the most? I'm going to surprise you. I The opponent who is polite, courteous. Anonymous. Just courteous. <laughs> yeah. What do you think is the most important quality of an advocate? Courtesy. Politeness. You see, we are all at this level. Everybody's bright. Yeah. Everybody's clever. Everybody works hard. Right. The person I think who gets furthest is the polite person, the polite opponent who doesn't look down at you, you know, speaks to you respectfully, says, I understand your point, but you, can you look at it in a different way, in a quiet and polite voice? That's the quality that, to me, is the most important one. Right. And, and I, you know, you've done tons of cases, but if I just ask maybe one or two highlights. What are the cases that I suppose you argued that have stood out most for you, you know? You know, I think probably the first time, no, no, the second time I was in the Court of Appeal and one of my reported authorities called Taki Anafori. It was a case where Nigerian people had gone to Belgium and Holland and the Netherlands and they were hiring cars from her. Uh, the car hire company, and they would hire the cars, drive them back to England, and then export them to Nigeria. <laughs> okay? And so the issue arose, and they were just a conspiracy to steal. Right. But I took a point, the issue arose, well, it can only be an offence, it can only be a criminal offence if the offence has occurred in England. And if they gone to Holland and Netherlands to steal the cars, the offence has occurred in those countries because the offence is complete. Because you all, if you've all done basic criminal law, the appropriation is complete there, the taking is complete, the dishonesty is complete there, the intention to permanently deprive is there. <laughs> all the elements of the offence is there. So the offence is complete. So how can it be an offence in England unless the law in England says so? And at that time, 
there was provision that said it wouldn't it wasn't an offense in England. So I had these two these two people who were just, they were as guilty as sin. <laughs> but I took this point in the Court of Appeal and the Lord Chief Justice really liked me. It was, it was Peter Taylor at the time. And he really liked, he really was really impressed with this argument because no one had thought about it before. <laughs> but his his one of his sidesmen was was then Mr. Justice Sheeman, later Lord Justice Sheeman, and he hated me. He hated this point because it was a technical point, and you know they hate these technical lawyers. So he said to me, "But you know, surely in civil law, it's the, the, the law is the same." And he, he was starting to quote all these civil authorities. So and I didn't know I didn't know any of these civil authorities. So I just said to the Court of Appeal. I don't know these civil authorities. Will you give me overnight to look at them? And the Lord Chief Justice said, yes, yes, I will. So I came back in the morning. I, I spent all night reading these bloody commercial civil authorities that I was referring to. Came in the morning, and then I started to distinguish them all. And you could see the eyes of the Lord Chief Justice lit up. You know, really lit up. And he was looking at Mr. Justice Chiggins, so you see. So you got to see. see. <laughs> That was the most enjoyable. <laughs> and I found the reason why, again, why it was enjoyable. Then Mr. Justice Sheeman started to speak Latin at me. Okay. You know, Latin. And I looked at him and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my Lord, I didn't do Latin. <laughs> the Lord did not Mr. Ryan and Welsh said, neither did I. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I won the case. Right. And months later I saw the Lord Chief Justice at the function. He brought he was with a high, high court judge we with a high court judge and he brought this gentleman over to my table and said, that's the man responsible for letting all the criminals in England go. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that was the most uh, yeah I think that was the most impressive I think of the case that I, I ever did. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Ben. Can I just jump in? I just I know we're running out of time, but there's just two things I've got to ask you, uh, Ben. The first is how you form the question and how much time you spend on that. Very good. I still, after 33 years, type out all my cross-examination. I type it out, even now. Uh, and we now have something called vulnerable witness training in the UK, which may have come, may or may not have come to your part. But vulnerable witness training is a new advocacy, it's a new way forward. When you're doing a, a sex case, a rape case, or a case involving a child, we don't allow people to ask questions uh, as, uh, as we used to the traditional way. So the traditional way is you ask a closed question of a witness and you try and trip the witness up. That's not allowed any longer with vulnerable witnesses. Vulnerable witnesses, you, you ask open questions. And all the open questions you're going to ask, you have to submit to the judge in advance of the trial. And the judge has to approve the questions in what's called a ground rules here. And the judge will put a line through questions that they don't agree with. So I have always typed up my questions. And in fact, now it seems modern practice is, ca is catching up with me. And the reason why I type up my questions is because when I started off, we talked about this issue of prejudice. Uh, I used to call it rudeness. But what a lot of judges would do is you'd be in the middle of asking a witness a question and you're making progress and they don't like it. So they would interrupt you. And they would, the reason they would interrupt you was to disturb your flow, yeah, make you forget what you're doing. And sometimes they would interrupt you and they would misquote what you're saying. They say, Mr. Rayner, don't ask this question. You ask the witness this. Now, if you've written out your questions, you're able to say to the judge, no, I never. This is what I said. I've got it here, written here. Shall I repeat? And you did repeat what you've got written out. And also, if the judge interrupts you, you know where the judge has interrupted you. So you've still got, you know where you are in your questioning. So I had this habit of always putting things in paper. I would always put my legal arguments in paper. My nickname among some of the other barristers was Section 10. Because Section 10 of the Criminal Justice Act is a section that allows for agreed facts. <laughs> I would always put things down and try and get the other side to agree, agree fact. Because as I told you, advocacy is only opening your mouth when you absolutely need to. So if you can get the other side to agree, get them to agree. You don't have to be talking all the time. So I always write out 
my questions. And as you get more and more experienced, you're able to listen. You see, you've got, you know the questions that are there. You ask the question, then you listen to the answer. And then you think, is what the witness is saying making sense? Do I need to follow up with a question that's not down before you go back? Do you see? I do. I do. Brilliant. And that's really helpful. Thank you. And the last thing I have to ask you is this, and you've spoken about every time you walk in, walk into a court, whether it was when you first started or whether it is now, that clearly you're the different person and to the judge and to your opponents. But I'd like to ask you what effect that has on witnesses. So if there's a little old lady who walks in thinking she's about to get cross-examined by the public school English gentleman, and then she looks up and Benjamin uh, Aina stands up. And I would start by saying, Madam, are you all right? <laughs> and she would say, yes. And I said, good, you're not going to be there very long. All right, I just, just got to ask you one or two questions on behalf of um, my client. And I, I've got three topics I, I just want to ask you about, all right? So topic one is this, I mean, topic one. So gentle, gentle. You settle the witness. Even if you're about to rip the witness to shreds, you still, so for example, say you've got a case where the witness is the friend of the deceased, and you're saying that it's the deceased and the witness that started the fight. So your case is to try and rip that witness apart. So I might start in this way. I've got four topics I need to ask you about, and I know this is not going to be easy for you. So if anything I ask you, you're not sure about, just pause, take a sip of water, and then give your answer. You started the fight, didn't you? <laughs> Thanks for listening to our chat with Benjamin Aina QC. Please visit our website and our social media pages if you want more information about Ben and his cases. Listen to the voices of the advocate.